Beanie fans and welcome to another episode of the Shit and Sarcasm Show. Today's subject of the agenda is this. This has been sent to me by a chap. <laughs> this, this bike here, which is a 69er all the way from China. That well-known suburb of Colorado called Shenzhen. I think it's Shenzhen. I'm not quite sure anyway. Anyway, the chap sent me this. It's like fucking massive, it doesn't even fit on my table. <sighs> yes, anyway, an educated Hambini fan sent me this. Basically, he'd uh, taken his crank out and then he was having a load of problems with it creaking and cursing and generally fanning around. So he sent it to me to, in a vain effort to try and fix it. So, let me talk you through what the problem with it is other than it's a mountain bike, and um, how we are going to go and fix it. So here are my gauges, 46.02, 46, 45.96, 45.98. So if we start with the 45.96, so this is a PF30 shell, so it should be 45.95 to 46 mil. That isn't going in. You can also tell that it's ever so slightly oval. So I've put the uh, the micrometer in. So this is, it'll give you, it's a three point ball mic. If you can just about see, hopefully, if I turn the focus on to manual, fucking hell. Right. It's about 45 point, ooh, eight. Four, eight, five. So the chap was going through bearings rather rapidly. So you can tell that's undersized. Done the same thing on the other side and that's also undersized. So this is gonna need a bit of tickling. Now, what we've got here is a fine piece of evidence or shite, depending on how you wanna look at it. This is a rotor, capic, capic, something like that axle from a mountain bike so it's a 1x transmission so that's the uh, the drive side and on this side you've got the um, power meter I think it's a power meter I'm not quite sure it says in spider I assume they were power meters but I could be wrong so it's got that and then across here and then the non-drive side crank arm this comes in three parts. So if I undo this bolt, okay, so I have rigged it because I've already undone it, but just to make life easier. This comes off and you're left with this. Okay, so this is the axle. This axle is completely fucked, but it is a good example of under rotation gone to a huge degree. So. Uh, it says on here it's 141 millimeters. I assume they measure from there to the end, which is a, just a shit way of doing it, but I'm not quite sure. Oh no, they measure the whole thing. Really, the, the dimension that's important is the distance between uh, one side and the other crank, or the distance between crank arms when you put it all together. So that's about 110. Anyway, that aside, if you look at this, this is fucked. It's completely fucked, but it's very good evidence. Bearing tracks here and here, they're quite obvious. Now, on this, right, you, this has had horrendous misalignment because over here, if I run my finger over it, can't really um, determine much. But if I go over here, there's a huge lip on there. There's a absolutely ridiculous lip. Now, I've just I've measured this, and this is. 29.9 ish millimeters there. The virgin material, the untouched material is like 29.98, 29.99, so it's 30 mil. I've also checked along here and it is um, uh, you know, not bent. Um, so rotor, I don't think they, I don't think it's a problem with the axle at all, but the, the misalignment on there is horrendous, absolutely ridiculous. So on, on there, that's the bearing track. You can see the load mark. So here is where uh, this axle hasn't been loaded that much. 
and then the other side so 180 degrees over it's been loaded excessively and then it's opposite on this one so where you've got a loading mark on that one you've got an area of um, low loading on the uh, drive side and then flip it over and you've got your high loading uh, on that side and then not much loading on this side so that's how that works the other telltale giveaway that this is like properly fucked is is this track or tram line however you want to call it it's fairly narrow there it's about seven mil when you get to around to here it's gone off so you can almost guarantee well it's, it's a guarantee that that bottom bracket on the bike is misaligned so that's what we've got um, and now we need to know how to fix it well, here we go. It's that time of the show again. It is time for PowerPoint. Now, some people tune in just especially to watch me and my hair. God, I am so damn good looking. I'm certainly the most attractive aerodynamicist out there. Anyway, right, we digress. <laughs> I love to digress. This is just my chance to have a bit of fun. Now, the Karen Friendly edition YouTube is a bunch of YouTube are a bunch of Karen sympathizers. So the famous scale has had to be modified. Right. Anyway, I've I've pissed around enough now. The 69er bike gets reamed by a tool from Marseille and here is my tool. It is 24.99 millimeters across there and 13 millimeters across there. It is my tool of choice. I have some other tools, which are like 30 centimeters long and you know, do some things with them, but there we go. Right, by Hambini, aged five, the merch has been temporarily disabled while, while I figure out the current EU VAT system, which I haven't quite figured out. Right, and you can find me on Grinder at Timmy's Tea Room on Tuesdays, and that's Timmy's Tea Room in Cool Blends. First up, we have, oh shit, the detailed analysis of wanketeering. Right, so it's it. Oh, <laughs> I'm not quite sure how that happened, but that was one hell of an interest in introduction. Um, Time for a dose of sarcastic engineering piss taking. So let's do that now. Uh, right, this is the Niner Bikes website. So on the Niner Bikes website, well, let's have a look down here. Oh, Bike Rumor 2019 Editor's Choice. Do you know how much credibility that gives you? That gives you about as much credibility as a five-year-old on YouTube who just goes around slagging off people generally because they can't drill round holes. I'm sorry, can't make round holes, but there we go. Right, so this is their website, all of this stuff. Um, oh, here you go, here's some excuses. Hello, Niner. Yeah, so where's my new bike? Let's click on it. So this has been written by Niner. Oh, it says by Zach Vestal, don't know who he is, but he obviously works at Niner. Da -da 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 -da. I want to ride my bicycle, I want to ride my bike. Those prophetic lyrics now me not being a native english speaker because i'm french has no idea what prophetic means is that like pathetic i don't know anyway if you can read down here it's basically justification for them not being able to supply bikes but anyway right what's this mountain bike geez they've got quite a few bikes in here let's click on what's the one that looks the nearest to that one that one the air 9 rdo Exquisite, oh, this is just pure gold. Exquisite engineering, exquisite. You are about to have a new one ripped, right? Niner's history is rooted in the evolution of mountain biking. From the introduction of our first hard tail more than a decade ago, we've worked tirelessly to push the limits of what people think is possible. <laughs> when it comes to the construction, geometry, and handling of premium bicycles, <laughs> This is just pure gold, pure gold. Right. <clears throat> I don't know what to say about this. <laughs> it's exquisite, it's exquisite. Right, we're gonna get off here and then go back to the presentation because I'm just having a field day. Right. 
I've come back to the slide as you can see and I just had to press that button again because it was time for a dose of sarcastic paint engineering piss taking. Now some people don't like my sarcastic engineering piss taking so we'll have to be a bit serious now and we will turn the pen on. So at the point the pen is working is the pen is pen is WKG. <laughs> you can put so many word letters in between WKG and get something else. Right, first screw up. Now we get to something a bit serious now. This is a diagram of a typical crank set. So you have um, the non-drive side over here and the drive side over here. And a critical value is something called the DBCA or distance between crank arms. What you want is you want the bearings, so that's this bearing here and this bearing here, to be as wide as possible. So you want them to equal the DBCA. And that is what you typically have over here. So over here, you can see the bearings have moved wider. Now the reason that is beneficial is the loading on the bearings reduces significantly. So the um, it's called a, a moment. Um, and the moment produces an axial force. And what you want to do is you want to minimize that. The other thing that is advantageous in doing this is if you've got misalignment between the um, two halves, which is, well, it's, it's so common, it's ridiculous, then having the um, distance between them uh, wider allows you to have um, more room for absolute error. So if you're quite, narrow and you have i don't know a centimeter of um inaccuracy it'll look like that but if you make it wider that inaccuracy the angle between gets more preferable so it's more tolerant to um screw up so that's the first thing so fitting uh, this niner 69er bike with a um narrow um bottom bracket not good next thing ah oh, the fit the fit was ridiculous 0.14 millimeters undersized and the misalignment is irrelevant when it becomes uh, that that badly undersized so you know the the fit is measured uh, on the outside so if this is a picture of the bearing you've got a section of the draw, uh, bearing here so it's it's this dimension here that um, is the uh, the problem one so that is too tight now what that does is it distorts the outside of the shell. So I've lost my pen. Yeah, so you can see the, sorry, outside of the race of the bearing gets distorted. And that in turn causes you to have no bearing clearance. Um, and I've just said about the outer race being distorted. So no bearing clearance means that as the bearing goes round, it's uh, it's getting stuck, it's jamming, and you can usually feel that as as you turn it around. It's like a ratchety or gritty feeling. If it's like a moderate amount of too tight fit, it'll usually bed in. But if it's tight to the point where it's properly ratcheting round, then um, you're screwed. You need to sort that out before you do anything else, and that's what's happened on this Niner bike them and their exquisite engineering. Exquisite, I'll have you know, exquisite. Just to give you a, an illustration, this is lifted from the SKF book, so I need to give them credit. Skanska Kugelfabrik, SKF, Swedish ball factory. <laughs> right. The, the outside, this is the you know the same section of the bearing. Um, if, this is, if you're going to look at fits, have a look in the SKF book. What we want is we want the bearing to be re restrained on the outside, so on the housing. So you would look at interference fit on the housing, and you can see this line here. So what you want is something like um, an N7 or M7, so, sort of. Ideally, in, in any kind of bike, you want somewhere between interference and transition. Um, so I typically go for M7, and when I go for M7, I make it smack bang on the line between transition and interference. A lot of people um, 
there's a sw general swaying towards a looser fit and I'm sort of moving towards that as well. The reason for a looser fit is as you pull the bearing out, if you've got um, retaining compound ho holding it in, um, it doesn't damage any of the surfaces. So you've got a um, much better life cycle by doing that. So that's one of the reasons for doing that. Um, just for interest, the um, shaft fits, so the axle through the bottom, are here. Now uh, you can, I've said this before, but the way to note the difference is the housing fits have a capital. So M capital, M7, and then M small is M5. What you will notice is the shaft fits tend to have a tighter tolerance than the housing fit. So if you look down here, these are all like five and six. That's the grade of the tolerance. Whereas up here, you've got nine, seven, and the the tightest one is the six. So the Niner bike, the interference is so tight, it's actually off the scale. I think it was worse than an S, which is where the scale I think it stopped. I mean, it was just ridiculous. I've never seen anything like it whatsoever. Right, the result. The result is a total shaft. So this is the bearing, you're looking at the bearing, and that is what happened to the shaft. So, um, I mean, the chap that sent it in, he had clicking, creaking, and play. So those are the th kind of symptoms that you would get, and you've just seen the shaft and the little nick inside it. The the clicking is generally this gap, which I've kind of arrowed to there, so that there's a bit of clearance, so the shaft moves and that causes the click. It's one of the reasons why you want to avoid having metal on metal contact. So the bearings tend to be hardened steel and the shafts are aluminium. So there we go. Right. <laughs> You can read the title of this slide. I don't know who did this presentation. I'm going to have to find my secretary. Right. The key to this is, and I mentioned this on the first slide, is first of all, move the bearings outwards. And that does two things. It gives you better preferential alignment. And in this case, the damaged part of the axle will not be in contact with the bearing. So you can move it outwards. That, that damage to the axle will make the axle weaker. Um, so the do-gooders out there who love to like rip me to pieces, sorry, who try to try to rip me to pieces, um, will say that uh, you shouldn't be doing that. It's dangerous. Blah, blah 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 blah, all of that stuff. But we live in a practical world where cost of an axle, I don't know, hundred dollars, something like that. Um, might as well give it a go. So anyway, move the bearing further outwards and machine the bike for. I mean, this is just. Oh my god. The, really, I can't believe that even in mountain bike land they can't make a hole that's round and to the right size. There cannot have been any checks on this bike because it is so far undersized. Um, just as a little note, the chap did take it up with Niner and he got nowhere. So that's what he told me. So that's why it ended up here. Um, there's the other solution is, the second bit is to make a custom bottom bracket with the bearings outwards. I'll show you that in a minute. Um, right, now it's time for me to show you the 3D. Bollocks, discard. Right, let's go with the 3D. Hopefully this will work. Right, what we've got, and uh, there's some bug in SolidWorks because <laughs> this is the, um, this is what I've got at the moment. Um, so there's a bottom bracket. If I hit tick, see that one disappears. So this is bearings within the uh, extremities of the frame. It's a narrow design. And that is typical of PF30 and BB30. What we'd move to is this one, which is, see the bug, um, where you move the bearings further outwards um, outside of the frame's shell. The difficulty with this, and you can buy some bottom brackets that are what they call outboard bearings, um, is if you don't have the one-piece design then you're reliant on quite a small surface area to hold it in 
um, and it's liable to sort of, I don't know, bend outwards. So it's not, it's not ideal um, if you've got a two piece design or three piece design, but with a one piece, I mean, this is a proven design. So there's loads of these out there now. Um, so that, that's what we're gonna go for. Right, unfortunately, the Karen Friendly Edition doesn't have the famous scale. So we'll go back. So what I've done here is I've stopped the um, machining process halfway through. So you can see the line. So I've come in from the non-drive side and you can see quite clearly, probably halfway down, there's the line which shows you how much material had to be taken out and how much on the piss this was. So over here, it's basically flush. Over here, you see that big lip. So that's where we are. So what I did here is, I'm just trying to talk you through how you, you engineer this bottom bracket. Now, this um, bottom bracket, well the axle from the bottom bracket, the distance between there and there is 73 mil. So I've just got the ruler out there and hopefully you can just about tell that distance is 73. So the, the center between them is 73 divided by two, which because I can't do maths very well, we'll call it 74 over two, which is 37. So 37 mil from that side to that side gives you the middle. This is the bottom bracket that's been machined for it. Um, you can see the, what is it? If I put it in the green so you can see it, but there's an index line on there just to give you the, the alignment from it. Now, the center of this, because this is much wider, needs to be at 37 mil. So almost where the T is on boost, that needs to be the center of that. Now this is nominally 90 mil, uh, can't even remember now, did I make it 92, 95? 95. So about 47 and a half is the center. And if you bring that over roughly, it is, oh, I've got this the wrong way around, sorry. That is there, so it lines up with the T. So that's where we're gonna be running. The thing with this is, ideally, you want the bearings as wide as possible, but you have to draw a line somewhere because um, you may make it incompatible with a large number of cranks. So I've got that basically there. So that's where we're gonna run. So if I take this apart and then show you it built up dry, I'm just building it up now just to show you. So that goes onto there. If I can get it on. Like that. So this has got full seal bearings in it. So the spin is obviously not as good as uh, the usual ones and I've lost the index mark, never mind. Right, um, and then that goes on here. So that's the original uh, um, rotor part. I did check with rotor to see what the spacing was and in the end I just kept it as, as the guy had it before. So that's like that. Now if I take the uh, drive side, just bolt it up loosely so that you can see what we're doing. So that's the drive side on so you can see where the chain ring is going to go. and then non-drive side on like that. Again, bolt this up. It's always worthwhile test fitting it before you actually put it on your bike. So just bear in mind that when you actually clamp it up to the max, you'll get a bit more compression than you do just by hand. So that's where we have. Um, now there's a bit of play in there and that's been engineered, well engineered, I just say it's, it's a gap that uh, is there to allow you to put the preload on. So you just turn it over and then that play is gone. Yeah, there's probably a bit more that you can give it, but that's just the preload. So that will now go into the bike. So let's pop that into the bike and then see how we get on. So this is the bottom bracket in. I thought I'd do you a favour and not show you uh, 
uh, me spending the next six minutes pushing it in but anyway that's in uh, the bearings are all smooth um, so now we'll put the crank in so that's all together um, this a bit of play in that spacer because we haven't undone done the preload collar up so we just need to do that up we go just to take the slack up and then away we go so it's got full seal bearings in there so they won't spin well at all um, but it's a mountain bike so that's to be expected that's it finished the um, chains back on and it's all gone round I've spun it a couple of times and it seems fine And that brings us to the end of this video. Unfortunately, I couldn't do my usual shite videography because this bike's fucking massive. Anyway, it's been fixed. If uh, I've done something wrong, which I probably have done, and you're one of those do-gooders who likes to point it out because you've got nothing better to do because you've got a small penis, no girlfriend, no wife, no hairdresser, um, then do let me know. And as always, uh, yeah, whack the like button, whack the subscribe button, and uh, keep fucking your hairdressers.